On today's show, we tour beautiful Scarborough Golf and Country Club, a look at the official World Golf Ranking System, and have a chat with Adam Hadwin. This is Score Golf, the voice of Canadian golf. Score Golf is brought to you by TaylorMade, the number one driver in golf. Molson Canadian 67, the official beer of the PGA of Canada and the RBC Canadian Open. Tourism Prince Edward Island, come for the golf, stay for the party. Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Score Golf TV. How about this for review? This is the fourth hole at the Scarborough Golf and Country Club. More about that in just a minute. On today's show we're going to be chatting with Adam Hadwin, Web.com Tour player this year, PGA Tour player next year. And speaking of PGA Tour players, we'll chat with some all about the official world rankings. Do they actually represent the rankings as the players feel they are? Well, we'll talk about that and discuss that with them. But right now, let's kick things off with a look around this beautiful 102-year-old Scarborough Golf and Country Club, the only Tillinghast golf club in all of Canada. Here it is, Scarborough on Score Golf TV. What makes a great golf course? A world-class designer, location, and layout all help. And it just so happens that Scarborough Golf and Country Club as all that and more. Just a 20 minute drive from the heart of Canada's largest city, this private golf course is ranked 69th best in Canada in our 2014 Top 100. Well, it's a great old traditional golf course. It's been around for 100 plus years. It's an exciting time to be around the club. Uh, we're really focusing on uh, being a premier club and offering premier experiences. Um, but we're, we've got a big focus on family as well. Dating back over a century to 1912, it's one of the oldest golf clubs in Canada. The original course was designed by Canadian Golf Hall of Famer George Cumming. But the course you see today was built by A.W. Tillinghast, one of North America's premier golf designers. Some of his most famous designs include Baltusrol, Wingfoot, and the host of the 2002 and 2009 U.S. Open, Beth Page Black. But Scarborough is Tillinghast's only layout in Canada. The golf course, it's, it's a real old traditional style, so there is a lot of elevation changes uh, throughout the holes. You'll see a lot of Tillian has courses where he does have his signature out on the course with the shape of the greens, with uh, the layout of the fairways, and with his target bunkers um, for people to tame at off the tees. The esteemed club has also hosted several prestigious tournaments, including our country's national championship. It's held the Canadian Open on four different occasions, seeing winners such as Sam Snead, Bobby Locke, Dave Douglas, and most recently Doug Ford back in 1963. In addition, Scarborough was the host of the 2012 Canadian Tour Championship, where BC native Eugene Wong holed out on the final hole to capture a thrilling event by a stroke. Located on a stunning piece of land, the architects didn't need to manipulate the contours of the property. There are no artificial water hazards either, as Highland Creek weaves through the property, providing aesthetics and adding strategy. Scarborough's most distinguished trait is its short par fours. It has several holes that play less than 350 yards, but what they lack in yardage, they make up for in subtle dangers, making club selection and accuracy crucial. The course plays as a true classic. It's that kind of course that you can come back, whether you play the blues, the blacks, the silvers, you can always be challenged, whether you want to play a four iron, maybe get aggressive, hit a driver. Uh, we always joke um, that the par four seventh is the toughest par five uh, in Ontario, because it plays so tough depending how you attack it. Uh, I just think that the prestige and the history of the course adds a lot to it. Obviously having a Tilly Haas course in Canada that we get to play every day is pretty special. Scarborough is not overwrought with fairway bunkers. Where they're used, they're used for precise purposes, often as markers at which to aim. Greenside bunkers, recently redone by Ian Andrew and Gil Hance, are perfectly placed and vary in size and depth, making it difficult to get up and down. At just over 6,500 yards, this par 71 course requires more brains than brawn. The course tees off with a long par 5 that gets you into your round. The fairway is generous enough, though you certainly can't play without some caution. A big back-to-front sloping green awaits approach shots. 
Of the course's many great holes, the fourth stands as one of Scarborough's signatures. The club claims that Arnold Palmer even named it as one of his favorite holes. The long downhill par three to a green guarded by the creek is an intimidating tee shot to be sure. It's a beautiful par three and uh, you're looking at probably about 180 yards to the middle of the green. Usually there's a prevailing westerly wind so it's always a little bit into your face. Depending if there's wind or not, I actually play it to the true yardage despite the uh, elevation. Great hole, there's a little creek on the side of the hole which uh, a few stories have come off of that. There was a hole in one made once with a ball landing in the creek, bouncing onto the green and then rolling into the hole. The shortest par four is number seven, nicknamed Gray's Ace, after Ontario Golf Hall of Famer Bob Gray, who once holed his tee shot there. It measures just 270 yards from the back tee and is drivable for the big hitters. Hole number seven, oh that's an interesting hole. That's a, a complete risk reward hole. If there was a definition for that, you'd be number seven. You can hit driver and take a chance and hit it onto the green. However, it is well guarded by, by lots of markers and a lot of trees around, uh, around the green. The downhill left to right par four 17th is a great penultimate hole with deadlock matches often decided here. The tee shot must be precise and well thought out. Players either just a friendly round or competing in the match, they're going to reach the 17th hole. It's again, it's another elevated tee. For the big hitters, it's not driver, it's usually hybrid or iron off the tee, strategically placed in the middle of the fairway, dog leg left, um, hitting over a creek to get onto the green. It's a hole that can make or break around. On the 18th, golfers are faced with a unique shot that they don't see very often, hitting it over a road. While it's unlikely to encounter a car, the nerves will still be flowing. Across the road is another winding and rolling fairway with an elevated green to finish your round. If you thought your round was over or your match would end in a tie, think again. The unique 19th hole will finish the job with one of the toughest undulating greens you'll ever see. We call it uh, our betting hole, so if a match is still all tied after the 18th, uh, one of the, the great parts of Scarborough is coming to the 19th, it plays about 132 yards uh, to a very small green, and looking, looking at the green of the clubhouse right behind it um, does play into your head a little bit. Through all 19 holes, you'll experience some fantastic greens, some of the best in Canada. And after the golf, it doesn't get much better than heading to the gorgeous veranda. The greens, I've golfed across Canada, United States, a lot of places, and I would put our greens up against any greens in Canada. They're phenomenal. And after the round, honestly, you come for a beer after on this patio, it's spectacular. A lot of the guys come back and have great times and tell stories on the patio. You just can't beat it. Uh, it's a phenomenal place to be. I, I wouldn't play anywhere else. Being a member at Scarborough means more than just world-class golf. Similar to many top-notch clubs in Canada and the world, the camaraderie is one of the highlights. The clubhouse at Scarborough Golf and Country Club is the original Victorian structure that opened in 1914, featuring an elegant setting with all of today's modern amenities. And with a six-sheet curling rink in the winter, Scarborough stands as one of the best private facilities not only in Toronto, but in all of Canada. We've got a great golf course, we've got, uh, we've got a great clubhouse and we've got a great membership which we don't really talk about a whole lot, but they're a fun-loving group, they like to enjoy themselves, there's no stuffiness here, it's, uh, you know, it's about having some fun and so uh, that's a big part of the social aspect of the club as well, so big, big, big component. If you're a serious golfer or just enjoy the game casually, getting out at Scarborough is a must. Designed by one of the most noted architects in the golf world, you won't want to miss playing A.W. Tillinghast's only golf course in Canada. When we return, we'll chat with Web.com Tour Pro Adam Hadwin. Well, in 2011, Adam Hadwin almost won the RBC Canadian Open in Vancouver at Shaughnessy Golf and Country Club. That would be a big step for a guy who made his start on the RBC development team. And next year, Adam Hadwin will be on the PGA Tour full-time after such a great run this year on the Web.com Tour. Let's spend a minute now chatting with Adam Hadwin. Teeing up Team Canada, a look at the success of the National Golf Team program. Brought to you by RBC, proud sponsor of Amateur Golf in Canada. Adam Hadwin knows firsthand what being in contention at a PGA Tour event feels like. In 2011, Hadwin found himself one shot off the lead heading into the final round of the RBC Canadian Open in Vancouver. And the year before, he was the low Canadian at the Canadian Open hosted at St. George's. At the time, Hadwin was only 23 years old, 
and was a refreshing face for fans of Canadian golf. Now he has a total of 10 professional wins, winning on the Gateway Tour, the Vancouver Golf Tour and of course the Canadian Tour, each one a stepping stone to bigger things. Back in March, Hadwin recorded his first win on the Web.com Tour, finishing birdie birdie to take the Chile Classic. He has since backed it up with four other top tens and now sits 10th on the Web.com Tour's money list with just over $220,000 in earnings. It was a great feeling to know that you know, the hard work that I had been putting in thus far was sort of warranted um, and sort of was looked upon as, as doing something well, uh, I, I guess. Um, you know, they, they've done some great things for the, for the up and coming juniors and amateurs uh, in Canada and, and sort of set this path and, of, of how, to, how to get us to the next level and, and they certainly provided me with many opportunities that I wouldn't have had otherwise. The confident young golfer has had a run at several PGA Tour events following his Canadian Open debut back in 2010. Unfortunately, however, he just missed earning conditional status on the PGA Tour and Hadwin found himself back on the Web.com Tour for 2014. The Abbotsford, BC native has now gained a couple of years experience surviving in golf's minor leagues, but the best part of all this is next season he'll have a PGA Tour card as the top 25 players on the Web.com Tour jump up to the big leagues beginning in October. Hadwin believes that his time with the development team has really helped him learn what to expect on the PGA Tour. The biggest thing was just having that opportunity to play. I got to play on the World Junior team that went to Japan, and that's what we do now as a, as a professional. And, you know, we see different cultures, different worlds all the time, and, and that's part of it. And then, you know, I, I would have to say, I mean, Team Canada got me my scholarship down at Louisville for sure. We played the University of Tennessee's event down there. They invited a couple national teams to come down, and. Um, I happened to play well. I took advantage of the opportunity and Louisville was at the tournament and, and next thing you know I've, I ended up there on a, almost a full ride. And being on the teams, not just Louisville but the, the national team, you have these guys, you know, this camaraderie with these guys that you can, you know, celebrate each other's successes with and, um, you know, you can push each other at the camps and, and in workouts and everything to, to be better and, and, you know, kind of feed off each other that way. You know, if one player is doing well, you want to play a little bit better so you're up there with them and, and it's, uh, it certainly helps. Hadman has now played 11 PGA Tour events and has never stopped believing in himself. The adversities Hadman has faced on the course have shaped his game and personality to help mentally prepare him for a career on the PGA Tour. I want to always have that love for the game um, that you have as a kid and get dropped off and you play till dark and I don't want it to become too much of a business and, and, and be too stressful and um, you know I've done a good job so far of, of balancing my time and, and, and knowing when I need some time off to get away from the game and, and such so if I can do that I, I think uh, you know continue to work hard and, and I'll just let the let the golf fall where it falls. There's no telling how well he will do on the big stage but with a couple of decent results Adwin could very well be representing Canada at the Olympics come the summer of 2016. a stretch to say that a Canadian came close to winning this year's RBC Canadian Open at Royal Montreal. This wasn't 2004 at Glen Abbey when Mike Weir seemingly had one hand on the trophy before falling to Vijay Singh in a playoff. And it wasn't 2011 at Shaughnessy when BC boy Adam Hadwin led on Sunday before a couple of costly bogeys proved too much to overcome. But that's not to say the 105th plane of our national championship wasn't successful from a Canadian player standpoint. Start with Graham Dillette. Canada's top ranked golfer put on a show in the second round, tying the course record of 63 while playing alongside Jim Furyk and Matt Kuchar. That left the Saskatchewan native two shots off the lead and chatter about a Canadian in the winner's circle intensified. However, Dillette couldn't carry the momentum into Saturday, when an even par 70 left him seven shots back, entering the final round. On that day, he birdied three holes coming home to move up the leaderboard and tie for seventh, much to the pleasure of the home crowd. It was Dillette's 20th PGA Tour top 10, but first at the Canadian Open, and he said afterwards that he found a big difference between contending in Canada and abroad. It was more fun. Uh, I mean, just because so many people were cheering for me, now I know how Phil and Tiger and all those guys feel all the time because it, 
it, it was it was pretty neat. And I mean, coming down 18 was it was a special moment. Dillette just barely edged out Brad Fritch for the tournament's low Canadian. After making the cut on the number with a birdie bomb on the 18th hole Friday, Fritch torched Royal Montreal's back nine with three birdies and an eagle on Sunday. His card was clean on the day, and the 64 moved him up into a tie for ninth, matching his best PGA Tour finish. For Fritch, raised near Ottawa, it was extra special performing so well in front of family and friends. It was really cool. You know, they, they've always been so supportive of me, especially right at the beginning of my career when I needed the money to start, and uh, they stepped up and, and gave me all the money I needed. So, uh, you know, they keep guys like me going when we struggle early on in our careers. So uh, it's great to have the belief, the support of all the people around me, and uh, it's always nice to have friends follow you. Uh, they don't get a chance to do it very often, so it's really special. And while those two PGA Tour members had excellent weeks, it was an amateur golfer who was just as much a part of the Canadian story. Richmond Hill, Ontario native Taylor Pendrith blasted his way into the headlines on day one, carding a five under par 65 to sit just a shot out of the lead. He struggled in the spotlight on Friday with a 75, but hung around for the weekend, shooting 68-69 to tie for 43rd in his first PGA Tour event. I had a lot of fun, concluded Pendrith. It was a great experience just being out here and experiencing what these guys experience every week, so I had a great time. No, the much discussed drought at the Canadian Open didn't end for our boys, and it now sits at 61 years. But what we took away from Royal Montreal is that there are strong signs the streak might not last much longer. When we return, we'll talk to PGA Tour stars about the official World Golf Ranking. Every week, the official World Golf Rankings come out listing the top players in the world from one all the way down to the bottom of the list. Do the players who are ranked, though, feel they accurately reflect who is playing the best at that time? Well, let's ask them. There's a new world number one ranked player, and he's won back-to-back -back major titles. Obviously, Rory McIlroy is the golfer we're talking about. With his recent PGA Championship win, coupled with his amazing British Open title, Rory McIlroy has become the biggest name in golf. He took the number one spot over from Adam Scott. Meanwhile, Tiger Woods, the oft-injured veteran and winner of 14 majors, is old news on tour these days. Despite spending over 680 weeks as the world's number one player, Woods has quickly become an afterthought as he battles through injury and subpar play in 2014. For close to two decades, Woods has been the clear-cut choice as the top golfer in the world. But as McIlroy's game soars, Tiger's game seems to be plunging. Given that Tiger won five times on tour last year and was named PGA Tour Player of the Year, it should come as great surprise that Tiger doesn't have a top 10 finish this season and has earned just a little over $100,000. But based on the official World Golf Rankings, you'd never guess that Tiger was playing as poorly as he has. He sits as the 11th ranked player in the world. But clearly at the moment, Woods is not even close to being one of the top 50 players in the world. So this begs the question, is the official World Golf Ranking a legitimate scoring system to define who the best player is? I think when you look at the whole value of each event and what they're worth in regards to world ranking points, I think it's pretty good for you know comparing it to you know world events and, and majors. I still believe that they can probably hold the majors a little higher than the, the world events. I think they're the same number of points here as a major. Well, we've taken that as the best measure of uh, a ranking system and that's what we play off. I think it um, doesn't necessarily measure the hottest player in the game over a short period of time, but it does over a long period of time. At the moment, three of the top five players have won on tour this season. Henrik Stenson, ranked third, is the reigning FedEx Cup champion. Meanwhile, Sergio Garcia, ranked fourth in the world, has finished second three times and is playing stellar golf. So the top five are pretty close to what would be considered as the best players in the game. Yet sitting at number 11 is Tiger Woods, whose last win came over a year ago and has no top 10 finishes to his name in 2014. Why is he still ranked so high? Simply because the rankings take into account all the results of all the tours across the world over a two year period. And there lies the problem, according to some players. We've been talking about that for years. Uh, golf organizations have been trying to figure it out for years. It's a tough way to do it. Um, 
maybe a one-year system instead of two-year system so you can tell who's the hottest right now. That'd be the only way I can see fixing it right away. But we all know in our mind, us pro golfers know who's playing the best and who's the best at the time. Regardless, the ranking system is written in stone and revisions to it don't happen very often. But on the tour, amongst the golfers, no list is needed to point out who the best are. These guys are out there hitting balls side by side with each other week after week. They all know who's hot on tour and they know who the best of the best are. It's the guys winning major events and going low every time they hit the golf course. When you look back on your career, and you think that, uh, you know, if someone looks at me and says, you know, you won two PGA Tour events, but if I tell, if you tell people that you won the British Open, that's a, that's a, that's a huge step. So I don't think you really get noticed unless you win a major. I think majors is what we all look for. We all look for uh, the chance to win one on Sunday afternoon. We always have the chance to lift the trophy. Media has put so much pressure on majors that now we, we start to believe that majors are the most important. World rankings, money list, FedEx Cup points, major wins, there are at least a hundred different ways to define who the top players are. But it really isn't that complicated. If you really want to know who is the best, keep your eye on the leaderboard. Because from week to week it seems like the same old familiar names sitting atop them and the same old names playing in the final groups on Sunday, well, those are your best players in the game today. Just around the corner, we'll wrap up another episode of Score Golf TV. Week Speaks brought to you by Bushnell, the undisputed number one laser rangefinder in professional golf. Well, Score Golf recently released its rankings of the top 100 golf courses in Canada. And one of the complaints we hear a lot of is there's too many Ontario courses on there. Well, folks, there's 800 golf courses across Ontario, so the chances are they're going to get the majority of courses on that top 100. There were 58 of them. One of the interesting things, though, is how many great courses in Toronto made our list. And that is no mistake. There are some fabulous golf courses in Toronto. And I know all you people watching across the country will say, oh, Toronto. Toronto, 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 but folks, Toronto has some of the best golf courses, not only in Canada, but in North America. Some of the best designers in the game all have courses here, including this one at Scarborough with Tillinghast. There's Willie Park golf courses here. There's Donald Ross golf courses here. There are, of course, Stanley Thompson golf courses here. Some of the best in the business made their mark building golf courses in Toronto, and they stand the test today by virtue of their ranking on our top 100. That's all the time we have for Score Golf TV today. I want to thank everybody out here at Scarborough. If you ever get the chance to play this golf course, boy, jump at that chance. It is a fabulous golf course. We'll see you next time right here on Score Golf. Check out Score Golf on all the major social media networks the next time you're looking for a Canadian golf course fix. Score Golf is brought to you by Tolson Canadian 67, the official beer of the PGA of Canada and the RBC Canadian Open. Clothing provided by Ashworth. All we do is golf.